Well, I mean, some people would say it is, but I wouldn't say it's heretical. It's just different than historic Christianity, where Mormonism, which arose the same year, made the same claims. Darby, who started dispensationalism, claimed that he was rediscovering the true faith of the apostles, but it had been lost. After the apostles had died, the church had instantly lost all this understanding until 1830 when he restored it to the church. The exact same thing Joseph Smith said when he started the Mormon church in the same year. It's just that Joseph Smith was in America, Darby was in England, and uh, the movements grew separately, and dispensationalism became absorbed into American evangelicalism, where Mormonism has always been seen as a cult, and rightly so, it is a cult. Uh, but <clears throat> I was not told that. When I was taught dispensationalism, I was just taught, this is what the Bible teaches about the end times. This is what Revelation means, this is what Daniel means, this is what Zechariah means, this is what the Bible teaches. And um, it wasn't, actually I was teaching the same things, verbatim, as my, and I'm pretty good at parroting my teachers. I don't do that anymore because I don't agree with my teachers anymore. But the, the, you know, the truth is, I learned how to say everything Chuck said, how to give all the answers he gave. To, uh, and, I mean, I remember when I teach through a book of the Bible, I remembered all the illustrations he used, all the cross references he used. I mean, I, I could just parrot it all and argue it. But I, I was never told this is just one viewpoint and a very modern one at that. I was just told this is what the Bible teaches. Now. My views changed without ever being told otherwise. In other words, no one ever, I, I was in dispensational circles when my ideas began to change from my own study of the Bible. I began to read the Bible and see things somewhat differently on several points. And uh, eventually my views evolved into something I'd never heard of before. And once, once they had, I wanted to hide it. I didn't want anyone to know it. I thought, boy, this is radically different than everyone else believes. I must be a heretic. And then I found out that there was a name for what I believed, and it was the historic view of the church, <laughs> at, least, at least from the time of Augustine in the fourth century until the 19th century. So 1,500 years out of the past 2,000, the church has taught officially what I had arrived at from reading the Bible myself, which made me feel somewhat better, although a 1,000 of those years it was the Roman Catholic Church, but Luther and Calvin and, Z and Zwingli and the reformers, they all taught what I now believe also. So I was somewhat comforted by the fact that what I thought was a heresy I had reached on my own study of the Bible turned out to be what the church had almost always taught throughout history until the 1800s. So I'm, my view is actually now called amillennialism. I don't think they called it that back when it was the only view. Uh, just like we didn't call dispensationalism dispensationalism when it was the only view we knew, you know. But uh, it, now, that we, now that people are familiar with all these different views, there are names for them. And the view that is held uh, by someone like myself and by all the reformers and the Catholic Church, and then before the Catholic Church, it was held by uh, major church fathers, um, it's called amillennialism. Now, as far as the approach to Revelation goes, it is different than the dispensational view of Revelation. But um, this gets a little, a little confusing, okay? because there's a lot to it. Um, there are four different ways that Revelation has been approached historically by Christians. And one of them is the one that you're familiar with, and that is that the idea that Revelation is about the end times. Revelation is describing the seven-year tribulation. Uh, that in Revelation chapter four, verse one, John is caught up into heaven when he hears a voice that says, like a trumpet says, come up here and I'll show you things that must take place uh, he, uh, after these things. He's caught up, that's supposed to be the rapture, and then there's the seven-year tribulation, and at the end of that, in Revelation 19, Jesus returns on a white horse with his armies of heaven. Then he sets up the millennial kingdom in chapter 20, and when that's done, then there's the new heavens and the new earth in chapters 21 and 22, and that ends the story. Uh, so, that's called the futurist view, for a very obvious reason. Futurist means it's about the future. So, that view of Revelation is called the futurist approach. And most people I knew, well, certainly myself growing up, I didn't know there was any other view. I mean, who, who, would, who would take a different view of Revelation than that? You know, you read Revelation, there's, you know, a third of the sea turns to blood, and there's hailstones that, that weigh 100 pounds, and there's locusts coming from the bottomless pit with tails like scorpions, tormenting people for five months. I mean, you've got all this. That certainly hasn't happened before. That must be the end times. That must be future. Because actually, if you just say it's future, anything, anything could happen in the future. You know, you don't have to justify it. You don't have to connect it with anything 
historical, you can just say, well, that weird stuff has never happened, but I guess it's going to happen in the future. And that's the futurist approach. Interestingly, the futurist approach is, again, one of the most recent approaches. Now, I mentioned dispensationalism being a recent development. Dispensationalism adopted the futurist approach. Dispensationalism is a system of theology where futurism is an approach to the book of Revelation specifically. Dispensationalism is an interpretation of the whole Bible. It divides the whole of history from, from Adam and Eve till the end of Revelation into seven dispensations, which is why it's called dispensationalism. And in each dispensationalism, they say God has a different covenant with people. In every case, they fail to meet their obligations in the covenant, and God has to bring judgment. And then a new dispensationalism starts. So they think the first one is from uh, the creation to the fall. They call that the dispensation of innocence. When Adam and Eve were created but had not yet sinned, they call that the dispensation of innocence. When, when they fell, that began the dispensation of conscience. These are not words you find in the Bible. This is what Darby and, and dispensations called them. The dispensation of conscience is so-called because Adam and Eve had the knowledge of good and evil when they ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. So um, from, from, the, from their sin until the flood was called the dispensation of conscience. And then from the flood to Abraham <clears throat> is called the dispensation of human government. You'll learn these if you haven't already in, in Bible college there. Um, and it's called human government because after the flood, God made the first governmental law. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. So for the first time, human beings are going to enforce penalties on other human beings for crimes. And so that's like the beginning of human, the concept of human, human government. So from, that's from Noah to, a, to Abraham. Abraham, of course, marks a, a major turning point and uh, the fourth dispensation, which is from Abraham to Moses. And that's called the dispensation of promise because of the promises God made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then when Moses comes, comes the dispensation of the law for obvious reasons. Moses institutes the law, and that continues until really the crucifixion of Christ uh, or the rejection of Christ by the Jews. Now, this is where dispensationalism gets a little strange and novel. The next dispensation was supposed to be the dispensation of the kingdom. And dispensationalists say that Jesus came intending to establish the millennial kingdom. But he failed to do so because the Jews rejected him. And the millennial kingdom had to be postponed indefinitely until Jesus comes back. And in the meantime, after Jesus was crucified and the kingdom was postponed, there began the dispensation of grace, or what we might call the dispensation of the church. And that continues until, at least till the rapture of the church. And then the dispensation of the, of the kingdom kind of starts to break in through the tribulation period, and then you've got the millennium when Jesus comes back. And, and, that's, um, and, and that's the last. The kingdom is forever, even though it's a thousand-year kingdom. They say they're, then the new heavens, new earth. I think that's still considered the same dispensation. Anyway, that's, dis that's why it's called dispensationalism. And the suggestion that Darby made is that each, in each of these segments of time, God had a different way of saving people. In Adam and Eve's case, by them avoiding eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In, uh, after that, it was from, um, well, just you know, following your conscience. It was a dispensation of conscience. Uh, after uh, Noah's flood, it was by submitting to, hey, Ron, uh, you know, proper government or whatever. In, in other words, each dispensation introduced a different age where God was doing something different. Now, before dispensationalism came along, the church always taught that there was certainly the Old Testament dispensation and the New Testament dispensation. Uh, there might even be some ways to subdivide them, but I mean, the main pivot of history is seen as the coming of Christ to end the the old covenant and to bring the new covenant or the kingdom. Um, so that's how, that's how dispensational is different. Now dispensationalism introduced some things that the church had never taught before, like that Israel 
even when they rejected Christ, did not lose their status as God's chosen people. That God has made unconditional promises to Israel, which even though they disobey and, and uh, reject Christ, they are still God's chosen people, and he still has some unfulfilled promises to make to them, which will be fulfilled in the end time. So again, they believe the church age is like a parenthesis, while the kingdom is postponed. It is postponed at the cross until the rapture. After the rapture, God begins to work with the Jews again because the church is gone. And the idea is that uh, the kingdom comes and he's working with Israel again as he intended to when Jesus first came. Now, one of the problems with this whole scenario is that Jesus really did bring the kingdom of God. The Jews did not thwart it. Jesus himself said, when the, when the Jews said to him in, in uh, Luke 17, they said, uh, when will the kingdom of God appear? He said, well, the kingdom of God is here in your midst. Uh, when they said he was casting out demons by Beelzebub in Matthew chapter 12, he said, no, I'm casting out demons by the Spirit of God, and that means the kingdom of God has come and overtaken you. And even in the, after Jesus was gone, Paul said, and, and after, of course, the Jews had, as it were, rejected the kingdom, Paul said in Colossians 1.13 that we Christians have been, by being converted, we've been translated out of the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's Son. So Jesus didn't fail to bring the kingdom. We're in it. If we're, if we're Christians, we've been translated out of the power of darkness into the kingdom, we're told. And there's, you know, out through the Bible, the kingdom of God is said to be the reality that Jesus did, in fact, bring in. Dispensationalism says he wanted to, but failed. Now, you have to understand what that's really suggesting. It's suggesting that for 4,000 years, from the time that God promised Eve and Adam that their seed would crush the head of the serpent, for 4,000 years the human race is waiting for Jesus to come, and it's going to be the climax of history. He's going to bring salvation. He's going to bring the kingdom. But, ah, uh, shucks, the Jews rejected him, so he had to postpone it another 2,000 years. And that was his, his first coming was rather anticlimactic. Yeah, he died for our sins. Yeah, we got forgiveness. But, but the real purpose of God, they say, I don't say this, but they say, is Israel. Israel is God's favorite people, hands down. When they rejected Jesus, God was kind of in a conundrum. What's he going to do now? I guess i got to find some time. Maybe I've got time. Maybe I'll bring some, some Gentiles in until Israel turns around and decides to be obedient. And so we're kind of an afterthought. The church according to dispensationalism, is kind of an afterthought. It's a, it's a parenthesis is the word that dispensationalists actually use. We're a parenthesis in God's dealings. Israel is his main love. But Paul said that the church is God's eternal purpose and that you know, bringing the Gentiles in is the fulfillment of the promises God made to Israel. There's plenty of promises in Isaiah and, and even Psalms and other prophets that God, God bringing masses of Gentiles into his kingdom when the Messiah comes, which he did come. And at the end of Jesus' life, uh, in Luke chapter 7, or John chapter 17, when he's praying that high priestly prayer, uh, I think it's verse 4, Jesus says, Father, I have completed the work that you sent me to do. Now, if his work was to set up the kingdom, and he failed in that, and had to postpone it for another 2,000 years, then he He's being a little presumptuous when he said, I have finished the work you gave me to do. No, in fact, you failed to do what God sent you to do. Um, so the, the point here is that dispensationalism teaches a different concept of even Jesus' whole purpose. And the idea that Jesus never really intended to start the church, not at least as a first point of interest, but to bring the kingdom to Israel. And only because Israel rejected it did he send the gospel out to the Gentiles and uh, so during this parenthetical outreach to the Gentiles, God's pretty much waiting for the time when Israel will be ready to, to accept him. And then he'll rapture the church out. He'll be done with us pretty much on earth. And he'll be working with Israel, his first love again. Now, this is the dispensational paradigm. Uh, it's not, it was not taught by anyone in the church until Darby. Now, well, I, sh I shouldn't say that because some people say, well, wasn't there this guy, you know, wasn't there a pseudo Ephraim who had some of that in his teaching? Wasn't there this other guy? you know, who did. There, there are apparently a handful of people through the past 2,000 years who had some of these ideas similar to Darby's. But no church ever taught it. No, no church, uh, it, was never, it was never the view of, uh, accepted by any group of Christians as a whole. And yeah, I mean, every idea in the world probably is had by somebody yeah, at one time or another, but 
when Darby introduced it, it just it spread like wild, wildfire. And of course, uh, with the reestablishment of Israel historically in 1948, that really encouraged them. Oh, you know, it's the last days and God's bringing Israel again. Although that's not really on, on their system, that's not supposed to happen until the church is raptured. But they're willing to fudge a little bit. I mean, I mean, we got Israel back. Isn't that what we're looking for? Uh, I don't know why the church hasn't been raptured since the church is supposed to leave when God starts working with Israel again, according to the dispensationalists. But like I said, they're willing to fudge a little bit just because they've got so much going for them and uh, so much momentum. So I don't hold the dispensational view anymore. Now, about Revelation, dispensationalism is the, the view that it, it adopts the futurist view of Revelation, which says that everything after Revelation chapter 3 is future. The first three chapters are the seven letters to the seven churches, and these, they say, represent seven epochs of church history from the time of Christ till the time of the rapture, and, or even after the rapture of the church of Laodicea. But, but then, in chapter 4, verse 1 of Revelation, John is caught up, and that represents the church being caught up in the rapture. Then you've got the tribulation and so forth. That's the dispensational approach to Revelation. Now, I gave up my dispensationalism back in the 70s. I was fully indoctrinated and fully a parrot, repeating the dispensational scheme everywhere I taught from 1970 till at least around 75. Around 75, I actually was forced by my own studies in the Bible itself to say, well, that pre-trib rapture, which is uh, something that Darby came up with. Uh, the, the church before Darby never taught a pre-tribulation rapture. The idea that the rapture would take us away seven years before the tribulation is Darby's idea. Before that, the church always believed in the rapture, but they believed it would happen at the second coming of Christ. <coughs> the rapture is part of the resurrection, according to 1 Thessalonians 4. The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we who are alive and remain to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and shall ever be with the Lord. So the resurrection happens on the last day, Jesus said, and the early church through, well, through to the present, apart from the dispensationalists, uh, has always taught that the rapture and the resurrection happen on the last day before, when Jesus actually comes back. It was Darby who introduced the idea of a partial second coming of Christ to the clouds to take the church out but not to come all the way down yet. You're going to take the church out, and seven years later, the church and he are going to come back. And so this pre-tribulation rapture is a new doctrine also. <clears throat> when I read, and I was, I was only exposed to dispensations, I knew nothing else. But I began to read my Bible look, and with no doubts. I had no doubts about the pre-trib rapture. But I started finding verses that made me have doubts. There are verses that don't sound like, like, like I said, Jesus said, I'll raise up my people on the last day. Well, not seven years before the last day, but the last day. Um, and, and verses like that. And, you know, when Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 1.8 that the suffering church in Thessalonica says that it's, it's a just thing for God to uh, give tribulation to those who trouble you and give you rest, that obviously be at the rapture. He says, when the Lord Jesus will come in flaming fire and his holy angels taking vengeance on those who don't know God and don't obey the gospel of Christ. So when God comes in flaming fire and destroys the wicked, that's also when we enter into rest. I mean, I began to realize there's not one verse in the Bible that actually says there's a pre-tribulation rapture. What I did learn is that I, although I had, had, I had 19 or 20 verses that I always use to defend the pre-trib rapture, and what happened to me was a, a student of mine, uh, someone who's sitting under my teaching and had learned dispensationalism from me, he, came, he went away and went to Bible college, had a professor who wasn't a dispensationalist and was challenging him. And so he uh, came to me and said, uh, Steve, I've got a professor here who doesn't believe in the pre-trib rapture. He's making us read George Eldon Ladd's book, The Blessed Hope, and it's really troubling me. He said, I need you to give me um, uh, you know, ammunition for the pre-trib rapture. So I did, I had it memorized. I sat down with him for probably a half hour or more, just like I am with you, and we went through uh, verse after verse that I used to prove the pre-trib rapture. There were 19 or 20 of them. I still have them in my notes online if you're interested in them. And I argued the pre-trib rapture from these verses, but as I was looking at these, 
I knew these verses like the back of my hand, but for the first time, I knew that this verse was going to be used by this student to try to convince this professor who doesn't believe in the rapture. So it, it better be a good one. You know, this better be one that he can't deny. And as I looked at each one, I remember thinking, oh, I wish that was stronger. I mean, I, I you know, I, I thought, of course, I believe the preacher rapture, and I can read it into that verse. But I could never read it out of that verse. I could read it into it, but there's no way I could read it out of that verse because the verse didn't say anything about a preacher of rapture. It said the kinds of things that a pre-tribber could interpret a certain way agreeable with a preacher of rapture. And I, each proof text I went to, one after another, I had the same sinking in my gut. I remember thinking, this verse doesn't say it either. This verse doesn't say it either. And I kept thinking, after I got through about half of them, I thought, where's that verse that really says it? Because I was sure there's a verse that really said there's a preacher of rapture. And I began to wonder, is there no verse that says there's a preacher of rapture? It's just I read it into all these verses because I've been taught to read it in there. And lo and behold, that is exactly the conclusion I reached. I got through all, all 20 of them, and I had not found a single one that said there's a preacher of rapture, yet I'd used the very best, the very best arguments from Scripture, the very best proof texts. And I... I mean, anyone who wants to bring up one, I'll be glad to look at it with you. But, but I, I was still pre-trib after that experience, but I was very shaken in that particular view. Because I thought, well, you know, I thought we had much stronger case than this. I mean, there's 20. I, I, I can comfort myself, well, there's, there's 20 verses that don't really say it, but they can actually be harmonized with it. So that's something. But I also had to say, well, if, if the evidential value of each verse is essentially zero, 20 times zero is still zero. You know, if you don't have anything in the Bible that says there's a preacher of rapture, the fact that you can find 20 verses that would be harmonious with that idea doesn't mean there aren't more verses that are inharmonious with it. And in fact, it is, is later I, I actually discovered verses that really made it very clear that, that not only did the church never teach it before 1830, but it's not taught in the Bible. And that's why the church never taught it before then. Anyway, so I gave up the pre-trib rapture that technically made me no longer a dispensationalist, but I still didn't know the word dispensationalism, so I didn't know that I was no longer a dispensationalist. I didn't know I ever had been one. But there were more things. The millennium, I won't go into it in detail like I just did with the rapture, but <clears throat> the, the way I saw the millennium, I began to be challenged by some of my students who didn't see it differently than me. They were just asking honest questions about it. They, they, they believed what I believed. But, they asked questions, and, I, and the answers I had to give them from Scripture, that, well, that, that raises new questions in my mind about this. <clears throat> Eventually, I had to, uh, my view on the millennium changed, my view on Israel changed, my view on everything changed, because once I began to be disabused of one building block of the dispensational system, all the others that were resting on it kind of tended to wobble and, and eventually crumble. It took years took years for four anyway on my own just reading the bible without knowing there was anything else out there i knew i was reaching other conclusions i didn't know if anyone else had ever done so i i thought every christian who is an evangelical was a pre-trib rapture dispensational christian until i wasn't one anymore and then <clears throat> i just thought boy i have really become a heretic i better i'll never teach on this stuff you know it ruined my my ministry it ruined my credibility uh, I can't teach otherwise because I see it in the scripture this way. I can't teach contrary to my conscience, but I can be silent about it. I had decided I would never teach the book of Revelation again. And here, lo and behold, the first book I wrote is a 600-page uh, commentary on Revelation. But, but I, I determined when I was like 21, I'd been teaching since I was 16, but I was about 21 or 22, I decided I'll never teach Revelation again. I don't have to. Why should I? I've got... 65 other good books in the Bible to teach. Who needs to teach Revelation? I actually wish more Bible teachers would reach that conclusion themselves. You know, uh, instead of, you know, on some of these radio shows, it's like half the people are teaching through Revelation at any given time on the radio. Uh, but anyway, I decided not to teach Revelation for a while. And then I, but then as I study other parts of the Bible, I remind, they, they connected with things I remembered from Revelation. So my whole view began to change, but I wasn't. I still was what we call a futurist about Revelation. Once I had given up every dispensational distinctive in my theology, uh, it, it was later than that that I found out that what I had reached actually had a name, and it was a historical view. In fact, the historical view of the church. 
<clears throat> that was a real relief to find out that I wasn't just a heretic. But, but I was surprised. Why didn't my teachers ever tell me that they were just teaching me one point of view? Why did they make me have the impression this is just what the Bible says, and as if that's what Christians always thought the Bible said? They didn't. Anyway, I became a little more well-rounded in my knowledge of, of Christian history and theology and different views. And I realized there's four views of Revelation. One is the futurist. Now, if one is the futures, namely that Revelation is about the future, how, how in the world could people find three different alternatives to that? I mean, well, one alternative is called uh, preterism. And that's the view that Revelation being incredibly symbolic, just like Daniel or Zechariah, if you study those books, you'll find that the visions are all very symbolic. Uh, monsters and dragons and things like that are really representative of nations rising from Alexander the Great and the Persians and things like that. Things that are really quite pedestrian historical facts from the ancient history are represented in wild and amazing visions in Daniel and in Zechariah and Revelation. But according to the preterist view, uh, Revelation is about the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the second temple system and the replacement of the old covenant with the new covenant. Uh, now, when I first heard that, it didn't make sense at all to me. I just couldn't. I thought, how can anyone believe something like that? You know? And the first book I read that actually had some of that in it was uh, a book by Jay Adams. Just a little paperback, not very thorough. It a, it, he went through the, the book of Revelation briefly and the Olivet Discourse briefly and, and kind of laid out kind of a preterist view of it. Jay Adams is a Reformed scholar. He was famous for writing many books on biblical counseling before you were born. In, in 1970, he wrote a book that became a huge bestseller among evangelicals called Competent to Counsel, and he launched the biblical counseling mo movement, which is called the Newthetic Counseling Movement. John MacArthur has a whole, a whole department in his, in his seminary of Newthetic Counseling. Jay Adams founded that. Anyway, um, Jay Adams took a preterist view, and when I read it, I thought, well, yeah, it was kind of interesting. He's, he, he made some good points, but I was not convinced. I had instead become convinced of an alternative view called idealism. Idealism teaches that Revelation's not really talking about, uh, it's not really visions that are to be fulfilled on, on earth in history. They are rather symbolic of Christian theological concepts. That theology is being presented in visual form. So that concepts like God's sovereignty over, over history, uh, the spiritual warfare between Christ and Satan, the victory of the saints, and even the vindication of martyrs once they die and go to heaven. Uh, that These are the kinds of theological concepts that Revelation is laying out in picture form. Uh, a little bit like what Pilgrim's Progress does, if you've ever read that book. It's, it's, a, it's a theological book told in story form of a, of a guy named Christian who's making a journey from the city of destruction to the celestial city and all the things he encounters. That's a very classic, important book for all Christians to read. But it's like Revelation is seen kind of that way. It's stories that are not really related to earthly events so much as they are making theological points. That's the idealist view. And I had read a very good argument for that view from uh, William Hendrickson. The book was called uh, More Than Conquerors. And I read that before I found the preterist view from Jay Adams. So I was now, when I read Jay Adams, I was now aware of three different views. The futurist view I had held, the idealist view, which I had encountered from a guy named William Hendrickson, though he didn't originate it. And now I knew of a view called preterism, which said that Revelation was written before AD 70 and <coughs> predicting the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in that year and the end of the temple forever. Now, there's another view and this is actually the view that has been held by more Christians throughout history than the others, and that's called the historicist view. All the reformers held it. The, re the, the historicist view is that Revelation is telling history from the time of John to the time of the end of the world. And as you go through Revelation, you're going through history, uh, 2,000 years of history. It's like a panoramic view of history and prophecy in the future. It's all future from John's point of view. But that the breaking of the seven seals, that represents the fall of the Western Roman Empire. And each, each break corresponds with something they could find from, you know, Alaric or uh, Attila or the, peop you know, the people who are invading Rome. And, and, and then the, the trumpets. Thank you, honey. Do you want coffee? 
Sure, that'd be great. Thank you. The trumpets represent the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire to the Muslim hordes and so forth. And then as you go through, each thing in Revelation is moving forward through what is now history for us, but it was all future from John's point of view. But most of it has run its course in our time. Now, this view, though, it was actually called the Protestant view for hundreds of years. It was actually held before the Reformation. There were a number of... Uh, when Catholicism was the only game in town in Europe for a thousand years, there were still some dissident groups like the Waldenses and others uh, who didn't, didn't like Catholicism, but they tended to take the historicist view. Then the reformers all took it. You know, Calvin did, Luther did, Zwingli did, uh, Wesley did. Uh, you know, it was the Protestant view from about... Well, from the Reformation, which was in the early 1500s, till at least uh, the 19th century, when dispensationalism kind of repopularized, or actually popularized for the first time, the futurist view. In fact, let me tell you an interesting uh, fact. The historicist view that the reformers held thought that the beast is the Roman Catholic Church. The, uh, the historicist view takes what they call a day for a year principle. So when you have 1,260 days, which is how long the beast's blasphemies continue in Revelation 13, 1,260 days, they say, well, that represents 1,260 years because, remember, they're spreading Revelation through the whole of church history. So they said the, the, the rise of the papacy, the popes, was the rise of the beast around the year 600 and that the, the beast would continue to blaspheme uh, for 1,260 years corresponding to what the Bible calls 1260 days. By the way, this way of looking at things is, has no biblical basis. It's just the way they did things. And so they thought, the, they thought the papal church would fall and Jesus would return in the 1800s because they measured from 600 AD when the popes arose. 1260 years brings you up to about 1860. And uh, they recalculated for different lengths of years and so forth. But Right in the middle of the 1800s is when a lot of people thought Jesus was going to come back and, and the Protestants believed the, the papal system was going to disappear. Because, but when it didn't, it was a huge disappointment, not to the Catholics, but to the Protestants. And um, like the Seventh-day Adventist movement rose out of that disappointment. Uh, there, a group called the Millerites thought that Jesus was going to come back in the 1840s based on this method of interpretation. And people sold what they had and they put on white robes, went out on a mountaintop, waited for Jesus to come. He didn't come and, and that actually was called the Great Disappointment. A guy named William Miller had led people astray in that. But his movement kind of dispersed, but some of them regathered under Ellen G. White and became the Seventh-day Adventists. And the Seventh-day Adventists today are the only people I know who still teach the historicist view. What Ellen G. White did was a real tricky thing. She said, well, we thought Jesus was going to come back in the air, but actually he, he didn't, we misread it. He wasn't coming back to earth. He was coming out into the uh, outer court of the temple in heaven uh, for the investigative judgment. I mean, she came up with this new doctrine just off the top of her head to explain the embarrassment of being wrong, uh, which is what cults do. The, uh, the, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses did the same thing. They preached that Jesus would come in 1914. He didn't. They said, well, he came in another sense than what we were thinking, you know. And It's just, you know, when you prove you're wrong, but you're supposed to be the only ones in the world who's right, you've got to somehow cover your butt. And that's what they did. But honestly, historicism just isn't credible anymore because it ran out of years. It was very credible, and it was like the, 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 almost the universal Protestant view up until the 1800s. But it's, you'll find, like, and you won't find anyone who teaches that view today except the Seventh-day Adventists and a, a few others. I've met a few other individuals who do, no churches. But. So we got four views of Revelation. You've got the historicist view, which is fairly discredited in my opinion. You've got the preterist view that sees Revelation as primarily about the destruction of Jerusalem. You've got the idealist view which is that Revelation is kind of a symbolic, dramatic uh, portrayal of, of Christian concepts and ideas rather than specific events in history. And then you've got the futurist view. What's interesting is where the futurist view actually came from. It came from the Catholic Church. Uh, there was a Jesuit in the late 1500s named Francisco Ribera, Spanish Jesuit, 
Now, I don't know if you know, but the Jesuit order in the Catholic Church rose up to defend the popes. The Jesuits are like the defenders of the popes. And this Jesuit priest named Francisco Rivera wrote a commentary on Revelation in which he said, the Antichrist, that, that's not the popes. That's a guy who's going to rise up in the end times in the last few years of history. And he introduced what we now call the futurist view. Revelation isn't about history, it's about the future. It hasn't happened yet. Now, Protestants totally rejected this futurist view for about 250 years or more because they recognized it as a Catholic attempt to rehabilitate the Pope from the, the reformers who were saying the Pope was the Antichrist. And so, so the, the Protestants saw this as just, you know, a transparent, uh, you know, ad hoc interpretation to try to protect the Pope from criticism. But in 1826, a guy in the Church of England, an important guy, is the librarian to the Archbishop of Canterbury. Now, if you don't know Anglican Church, it's like the English version of the Catholic Church. But they don't have the Pope, they have the Archbishop of Canterbury as their, instead of their Pope. And the librarian to the Archbishop of Canterbury, a guy named Samuel Maitland in, in 1826, read Francisco Rivera's works, found it persuasive, and he was the first Protestant to adopt the futurist view. That's just a few years before Darby came along and introduced dispensationalism, but he adopted the futurist view, which had come in through Samuel Maitland, which had come from the Jesuits to rehabilitate the Pope's image from what the Protestants had always said about him. Anyway, complex. But you asked what my view of Revelation is, and this has taken now an hour to answer your question, or 50, 45 minutes so far. Um, my view today of Revelation combines aspects of the preterist view and the idealist view. It's obvious I don't believe in the historicist view, and it's probably obvious I'm not promoting the futurist view. But the other two views, I think they both have merit. And what I do is what I do myself. I mean, I don't think anyone else has to do this. No one else has to agree with me. But for my own conscience and my own reading of the scripture, I believe parts of Revelation are about the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. That, that'd be a preterist position. But I believe other parts are just like what the, uh, what the idealists say, that it's, they're just symbolically describing spiritual things that are true through the whole church age, but no specific events per se. Are those woven together? Or? Not woven together, but, but in discrete segments. And I, I have my own explanation of how you transition from one segment to the next. I believe the first uh, nine chapters should be seen in a preterist way. Chapters 10 through 13 I see as an idealist, 14 through 19 as a preterist again, and 20 through 21 as an idealist. Now, I, I'm not going to go into that now because I've spent so much time already answering this one question, but, uh, and if you have follow-up questions, you're welcome to bring them up, but my lectures on Revelation actually give the reasons for my reaching these conclusions. And once I dislodged from my dispensationalism, I had no, I had no skin in the game. You know, I could, any view might be right as far as I could tell. You know, I just wanted to read, I wanted to see what had the best arguments. Uh, and, I, and by the way, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I've never worked for any denomination or worked for any religious organization. I'm a freelance guy. I'm not paid by anybody. And so I've always been free to, to follow my conscience. And you might say, well, how's that different than being in a denomination? Well, just think about it. Denominational preachers are taught to teach what their denomination teaches. And they are then, when they get a job, paid to teach what their denomination teaches. Now, some denominational pastors will leave the views they were taught and leave their jobs as pastors because of it. I know some who have. But most find it very difficult to consider doing. You know, if you've been trained in a certain theological system, now you've got a job pastoring a church in that theological system, you've got very little motivation or incentive to change your mind, especially if it's going to end your ministry, you know. And I was fortunate not to have any of that because no one was ever paying me to teach anything at all. I just left home when I was 17, was teaching the Bible as a free agent in the, in the Jesus movement. No one's ever hired me. I've never, never wouldn't let them. I mean, I, I wouldn't take any salary for ministry. I live by faith. So I was free from all demands to hold to this view or to change that view. So I was able to just look things over, you know, and think them through over the years. I didn't change very fast, but 
eventually I reached the view that the best arguments for certain parts of Revelation is that they are, it is talking about AD 70. Uh, and, uh, and other parts strike me as the best arguments to be idealist. And if you want the more, you know, detailed thing, my lectures on Revelation, of course, are free. All my lectures are free and they're online so you can listen to them. You, you, you might be especially interested in uh, how I treat Revelation 10, which I consider to be a transition from the preterist part to the idealist part and why, why I do. Uh, but anyway, so you asked a, a small question there and I hope I answered it. That's the clearest presentation I've ever heard you give on that. Well, I'm talking to children here, you know? <laughs> no, well, no, you. no offense, but youngsters, you know, young people. And I, I try to think of, well, what, what if I was sitting in their shoes when I was that age? I mean, I want someone to make it clear to me. I'm sorry that no one ever did. But uh, anyway, I, I also want you to know this, that I don't care if someone agrees with me about it or not. I have nothing to gain by people agreeing. I've got nothing to lose by people disagreeing. So I just give it up. I'm a teacher. I'm not an indoctrinator. I'm a teacher. This is the information. You can do with it what you want to and, and whatever conclusions you reach with my blessing. Uh, any other questions? Eric? Can you take as much or a little time as you would like just to expound on 70 AD to Paul Jerusalem because maybe most of these youngsters have never heard of That's true. When I was when I was studying and and being raised and teaching in my early years, I kind of, I think some I think I knew that Jerusalem had fallen to the Romans in AD seventy, but I had no idea if that was any more important than any other historic event. And uh, what really did make a difference is uh, seeing how often Jesus Himself spoke of how Jerusalem would be destroyed in that generation. And all the righteous blood from Abel to Zechariah was going to come on that generation uh, in this judgment that's coming. And I began to see that John the Baptist was saying that this judgment was coming on Jerusalem and that, you know, there's fruitful trees and there's fruitless trees. And the fruitless trees are going to be burned up and, you know, cut down, thrown to the fire. There's wheat and there's chaff. God's going to gather the wheat and he's going to throw the chaff in the fire. He was talking about how Israel was facing in that generation the, the uh, disaster of its history. And that God was calling the faithful remnant in Israel to come and follow the Messiah so they could escape what's going to happen to the rest of the nation. And it's interesting that uh, <coughs> Jesus many times made reference to this, to the fact that Jerusalem was going to fall. In some of his parables, like the parable of the uh, vineyard, the vineyard keepers were the Jews who were keeping Israel the vineyard, and God sent his servants to get the fruit, and they'd say they'd kill the servants or throw them out, not give the fruit. So he, the the man came. He sent his son. He said, "Surely they'll respect my son." And the vineyard keeper said, "Oh, this is the heir. Let's kill him and keep his inheritance for ourselves." And and by the way, it says the Pharisees realized, recognized he was talking about them. So they're going to kill him, and uh, they'd killed all the prophets, all the other servants that the master had sent to get the fruit. And the fruit is justice and righteousness, because in Isaiah five, the vineyard is Israel. And God's looking for fruit that he says is justice and righteousness. So God wanted Israel to produce justice and righteousness. That's why he gave them the law, so they would. And, uh, but instead of doing so, they killed the prophets that came and said, where's the justice? Why aren't you producing the justice God demands and the righteousness? They killed the prophets and threw them out. And so last of all, he sent his son, Jesus, and they killed him too. Now, after that, it says, Jesus says, what do you think the owner of the vineyard is going to do to those people who killed his son? And the audience answered, he'll utterly destroy those wicked men and lease his vineyard out to other tenants who bring the fruit forth in its season, who give him the fruit in its season. And Jesus said, therefore, speaking to the Jewish people, he said, therefore the kingdom of God is taken from you and given to a nation that will bring forth the fruits of it. Now, it's interesting. The answer is he's going to utterly destroy those people who killed his son and give the opportunity to bear fruit for God to another people. <coughs> the next parable, that, that one's at the end of Matthew 21. At the beginning of Matthew 22, there's a parable of a wedding feast. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a king who made a marriage for his son. He invited his friends, which are the Jews, and they made excuses and didn't come. So it says the king was enraged 
and he sent, sent out his armies and destroyed them and burned down their city. That's what happened to the Jews in AD 70. Then it says, then he said to his servants, go far and wide and invite anyone who will come in. That's the Gentiles coming in afterwards. I mean, Jesus had many references to this, the cursing of the fig tree. When he said, you'll never know no, every fruit from you again. The fig tree is an established symbol of Israel too, and it, it, it shriveled up. Uh, and so, I mean, there's John the Baptist and Jesus had many things to say about that. In fact, verses that we're familiar with that we never thought to associate that way, like in, in uh, the 13th chapter of Luke, the first five verses, <coughs> uh, some, some people came to Jesus and told him about the Galileans that, that Pilate had killed in the temple while they're offering their sacrifices, expecting Jesus to get very angry, of course, because he was a Galilean and the Roman you know, oppressor, you know, they all hated and Jesus said, do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than other men? No, but I say, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. And he said, he said, those 18 men upon whom the Tower of Siloam fell, do you think they were worse sinners than other men? He said, no, unless you repent, you'll also likewise perish. Now, we, uh, we think of that as a verse about going to hell if you don't repent. In fact, one of the books I read on, on hell was called Repent or Perish, based on that, those verses. <clears throat> But Jesus didn't say, if you repent, you'll perish. He said, if you, don't repent, if you don't repent, you will likewise perish. Likewise means in the same way. In other words, th these people were slaughtered by Roman soldiers in the temple. These people died from falling masonry when the towers of Jerusalem were falling on their heads. He says, you guys are all going to die the same way if you don't repent. Because that's what happened when the Romans came. First of all, they broke down the walls. People were you know, crushed under the stones. Uh, the, the surviving Jews fled into the temple. The, the Romans burned it down and killed them all in the temple. Exactly the things that had happened to these few people that Jesus was talking about. He says, now, same thing's gonna happen to you if you don't repent. Now, see, what if they did? History tells us that before the Jewish war, when the, the Romans attacked in 66 AD and finally destroyed the temple in 70 AD. Before the war, the church in Jerusalem got a, a prophecy, a, an oracle, a, a member of the church gave a prophecy telling them to flee from Jerusalem. And all the Christians in Jerusalem fled east across the Jordan River to uh, a, t a town in the hills called Pella. We have this from church historians like Eusebius. He, he talks about how this happened. And... <clears throat> So when the Romans came and besieged the city and no one else could escape, the Christians had all fled. So we have, when Jesus and John came, Israel, it, there's, there's a, the nation is apostate, but there's a faithful remnant, like Mary and Joseph, like Zechariah and Elizabeth, like Simeon, like Anna in the temple, like Jesus and his disciples. They were a faithful remnant in Israel, and they all escaped, and they did not perish when Jerusalem was destroyed, but the rest did. And Josephus, the historian who was not a Christian, but was a Jew who was there, he was actually in, a participant in that war. He wrote the history of the war, and he told things that happened that sound just like the book of Revelation, to tell you the truth. And um, anyway, it was, it was a hell, it was a holocaust. And uh, it was the most horrible thing. Jesus said nothing like it before or after. Could you give a few of those details, falling stars and all that? Well, um, the people inside the city of Jerusalem when it was under siege were, of course, starving. That's the idea of the siege. You, in those days, cities had a walled uh, fortress where the headquarters of the city and so forth were. And then outside the walls were the farms and stuff. You couldn't have all those farms inside the walls because, you know, all that acreage. So when, a, when an enemy army would come against a walled city, the farmers and the peasants and stuff would all run into the city, the gates would be shut, and they'd hold off the enemy, but they'd be separated from the crops. The crops are outside in the fields. And if it was a long siege, whatever food they had stored in the city would eventually run out. Now, during the siege, the Romans besieged Jerusalem for five months before it fell. And in the city, people were starving to death, and, but they, were, they went crazy. Now, Jesus said, that a vast number of demons were going to be unleashed on, on them. And when you read Josephus describing how people in the city were acting, even if you didn't know Jesus said that, you'd say, these people had to be demon-possessed. 
But it's a little bit like some things going on in our country right now. We say, whoa, how, did, how could anyone be so crazy? How could anyone be so, so mistaken 100% about everything? It's like right is wrong and wrong is right and up is down. And I mean, there, how could there be so many people who are totally wrong and so irrational? Well, <clears throat> some Christians, like myself, I, say, I think there's a demonic invasion of our nation leading people astray. But that, you clearly get that when you read Josephus. That the, inside the city, while the Jews were holding off the Romans outside, inside they divided into three warring camps and were killing each other. I mean, here, they were running out of food, and, and if one group had some food, the others would burn up the stores of the others because they happened to be hostile toward them. So the food that could have kept them all alive, you know, they were destroying food in their own city. And Josephus talks about just uh, rampant killing for no, for no reason. People got so starved they ate their children, uh, which actually Deuteronomy predicted would happen. Uh, and um, uh, Josephus talks about men who dressed up like women and they carried swords under their garments and they just walked down the street and unsuspectingly they just kill somebody. Uh, they would, uh, they'd kill people for no reason just because they're all murderous. And this is the Jews inside the city. They were, uh, Josephus actually said, they're, and he was a Jew. He was a, a, actually a, a Levite, I think. Uh, and he was a general in the Jewish army at the time. He said he, he thought there was no nation so depraved as his own people at that time. He, he said there never was a people so fruitful in wickedness as these people were. But he, I mean, he, his book is almost as thick as the Bible. You know, it seems like it's a very thick book about the war. He gave all kinds of details, but largely about how wicked the people were. And then, of course, uh, the Romans were chucking big rocks with catapults over the walls. These, he said these rocks were white so they could be seen against the sky and people could hide from them, but then they, they started coloring the uh, rocks black uh, so that they couldn't be seen. Then they killed a whole bunch of people. 100 pound stones, he said. Well, it's interesting because Revelation in chapter 16 talks about 100 pound hailstones falling on the city and destroying people. And Josephus, who'd never read the book of Revelation, said the, the Roman catapults were impressive. They were heaving these huge stones over the wall, white stones, and they were killing people. And he said each stone was about a talent, which is 100 pounds, which is exactly what Revelation says. Each hailstone was about a talent. So, I mean, there's, it's interesting, lots of stuff like that. There were signs and wonders. Josephus said the, 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 the signs that people reported, he said it'd be, he said it'd be impo it'd impossible to believe they were true if they weren't witnessed by so many people. He said, for example, at one point, soldiers in armor were seen running in the clouds. Like Jesus said, they'll see signs in the heavens and things like that. He said there was a star like a sword that stood over the city of Jerusalem for a, about a year. He said that at one point there was a huge gate of the temple that, that took several men to open and shut, and it just opened on its own, and a voice was heard saying, let us get out of here, or something like that, let's go hence. Uh, he said the priests were bringing a calf or a, a cow to be sacrificed, and it gave birth to a lamb as it was being led. He says, he says, I know, it sounds crazy. He said, if there hadn't been so many people who saw this, it'd be absolutely incredible. But well, still kind of incredible. But the point is there were a lot of supernatural things that happened. There's a lot of suffering. Uh, when the Romans did break through the walls, the Jews, many of them rushed into the temple. The uh, Romans burned it down on top of them. And then, uh, from what I'm told, there was a big gold dome on the temple, which melted because of the fire. And because the temple stones had been so perfectly uh, planed in the construction, they had not used any mortar. They said that a wisp of air couldn't get between those stones, uh, and they didn't use any mortar in making the temple. Well, from what I've been told, the, the, the dome, the gold dome melted, and the, and the gold kind of floated the stones up and it got in between the cracks and stuff like that. So the Romans, in order to scrape the gold off, had every stone removed so that not one stone was left standing on another, which is what Jesus said would happen in that generation. Remember, the, all of the discourse began with Jesus, the disciples saying, look at these stones of this temple. He, said, he says, not one stone is going to be left standing on another. They said, when will this be? He said, this generation won't pass until it happens. 
and it was 40 years after he said it that it happened. So, I mean, these are facts nobody told me. I didn't even know, I didn't even know growing up, and even as a teacher, a young teacher, I didn't even know 70 AD was anything very important. But turns out, as you read the New Testament, you find that it's considered to be the the signal that God gave that the old covenant is gone for good. The new covenant came, of course, 40 years earlier, but the, even the disciples in Jerusalem still went to the temple and did temple things until it was destroyed. It's when the temple was destroyed that it was like the total sweeping away of all the old covenant. In fact, it says in Hebrews 8.13, it says where there's a new covenant, it's made the old, the, the first covenant old. And he says, now that which is old is obsolete and is about ready to vanish away. Now, he's writing just before 70 AD, the writer of Hebrews. So he said, the new covenant has come with Jesus. The, the old covenant is old and obsolete. It's obsolete, but it's about ready to vanish. It'll, it vanished when the temple is destroyed. But anyway, all of this, you know, this is like unloading a whole bunch of stuff all at once, which is probably new to a lot of people, and I don't care to overwhelm. But anyway, studying and knowing the history uh, looking at the scriptures through the eyes of what was historically going on when John the Baptist and Jesus were preaching and what happened in that generation um, really you know, gave me a different outlook on a lot of those things. And now that was years ago. That was back in the, probably about 1979. No, no, it, it was, I became an amillennialist, I think about 1979. I became a partial preterist probably in 83. So that's a long time ago. It's been almost 40 years now. I've been partial predators. And in those years, I've taught through the Bible verse by verse about 16 times, and I've, it's only solidified my views. So again, when I say this, it's, this is all new to some people, and I don't want anyone to feel like, well, I'm uncomfortable with this, like, like, like I expect you to believe it. I don't care if you believe it or not. I don't care what you think about those things. I, I believe it. Yes. Free. So if you can get with us at some point, we can review 600 page commentary that's called Revelation 4 Views, a parallel commentary. What it does in the introduction, the first 50 pages of it, introduces these four different views and what the pros and cons of each view are. And I don't advocate my views in this book. Instead, there are four columns across every page. And it goes through every passage of Revelation and gives the historicist view of that passage, the preterist view, the uh, um, futures view and the idealist view of each passage all the way through the whole book of Revelation. And, uh, you know, it's a book you can buy, but we'd be glad to give it to any student who wants one. We don't have them here, but we'll get you one if you want one. Free. Uh, and, by the way, again, a person can read through that book. There's 200 and something uh, reviews of that book on Amazon, and a lot of people say they can't tell what view I hold, which is was my objective. I, I wasn't planning to advocate any one view, but to just educate people about what these options are and why why each view is held as they are and so forth. And it's, it's, a, it's a very well-reviewed uh, and very well-accepted uh, commentary. It's been out since 1997. Okay, we don't have to talk about eschatology, but that might be what's on everyone's mind. So, I mean, any, any question on anything is fine. Yes, did you, was your hand on the way up? Yeah, it is. Um, I was just, um, I've been looking through and listening to a lot of um, um, Jesus believing Jews. Uh huh. So, uh, Messianics. Messianics, huh? And, um, and one thing that um, I thought was interesting that, that kind of ties into Revelation was um, oh, clearly the, um, the crucifixion and the resurrection coincide um, on the calendar with Passover. Passover. Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. Well, I can comment, but I can't answer. Because uh -huh. um, there were three festival seasons each year that the Jews had to go to Jerusalem for a week each time and celebrate. And one was Passover. It was the first one of the festival year. And the second one was Pentecost. And the third one was uh, Feast of, uh, well, actually, 
Feast of Tabernacles, but Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, uh, the Yom Kippur, they're all part of that whole uh, thing. And th those, those are in the fall. Um, Passover's in the spring. Uh, Pentecost is usually kind of in the early s summer. And then uh, the Tabernacles and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, those, those, that cluster of events is usually in September, or at least in the fall. Now, we know from the book of Hebrews that those festivals all represent something spiritual that Christ fulfilled or, or will fulfill. And we know for a fact that Jesus fulfilled Passover because it says in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. So, and he says, therefore, let's keep the feast, not with the uh, leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of uh, sincerity and truth. So he says that Christ's death is our Passover. The seven days of unleavened bread corresponds to our life of uh, living without the leaven of malice and wickedness. Uh, so he spiritualizes it, of course. Pentecost was fulfilled with the Spirit coming uh, on the Christian church on the day of Pentecost. That was the Jewish Pentecost. And P Pentecost was, among other things, called the Feast of Ingathering and, um, uh, and, the, and of First Fruits. I mean, there's, there's another day called First Fruits that falls within the Passover, but the word First Fruits is used in more than one thing in there. But the, the idea is that the First Fruits of the church were gathered in, uh, into the kingdom, into the church. Um, on the day of Pentecost. And so Jesus fulfilled Passover at the Feast of Passover. Pentecost was fulfilled at the Feast of Pentecost. Now the fall feasts, many people think they have not yet been fulfilled. <clears throat> and many people think the fall feasts, trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, and all that, Yom Kippur, actually corresponds with things in the last days. And uh, this is something where dispensationalists actually actually have a lot to say. You know, they, they correspond these things in the fall festivals with uh, certain things they expect to happen in the tribulation and, and uh, the second coming of the rapture and things like that. Um, I'm not a dispensationalist, so I don't, I'm not inclined to assume that they're correct in their interpretations about that. But I, I can't say for sure that they're not correct about those, uh, some of the things. I mean, I don't believe there's a pre-trib rapture since the Bible t actually teaches otherwise, but I could, I could certainly see the fall festivals as having some connection with the end of time and the coming of Christ at the end of time and so forth, which is what dispensations always do. There are other possibilities though. Uh, and I have to say I'm uncertain about the fulfillment of the fall festivals. And the reason I'm is because the Bible doesn't identify them. The Bible does identify the fulfillment of Passover with the death of Christ. The Bible does fulfill the fulfillment of Pentecost with the giving of the Holy Spirit, but the Bible nowhere identifies in so many words the fulfillment of uh, the fall festivals. And, you know, one explanation for that is that uh, maybe they haven't happened yet and the Bible hasn't uh, discussed it. Um, but since the Bible doesn't identify the fulfillment of the fall festivals, it, reads, it remains open to more than one possible interpretation. There are some who would say that they were fulfilled in again, the destruction of Jerusalem um, a long time ago. There are, there's even one point of view that they're fulfilled uh, before pa Passover and Pentecost uh, because although they come later in our calendar year, on the, the Jewish, the Jews have two calendars. They have a, a festal religious calendar and they have a civil calendar. The festal calendar begins 14 days before Passover. Uh, and, and that's because in Exodus 20, I mean, Exodus 12, God, when he's uh, bringing Israel out of Egypt, said, this will be the beginning of months for you. Every year you're going to do this. On the 14th day of Nisan, you're going to take this lamb and so forth. So the, the month of Nisan, or Abib, it's also called, is when Passover was. And it was to be the beginning of their religious calendar. But for whatever reasons, <coughs> the Jews have... <laughs> a beginning to their political calendar just six months after that in the fall. And Rosh Hashanah is actually their new year. In other words, the beginning of their civil year is in, 
in September or October in Rosh Hashanah. And that means that if you really are looking at the civil year, the fall festivals come earlier than the spring ones because Rosh Hashanah and the Feast of Tabernacles is earlier. Um, and so it's not entirely clear. Some people would suggest the Feast of Tabernacles begins to be fulfilled when the word was made flesh and tabernacled among us, as John 1.14 says. So that, that that festival could have been when Jesus was more like when he was born rather than when he comes back. And based on that, some people feel that the actual birth time of Jesus was in September. Uh, nobody really believes it was December, but uh, no one knows when it was. But some have felt that Jesus might have been born during the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's when the Word became flesh and tabernacled with us. Anyway, there's all I can say is I'm aware of a number of possible theories about the fall festivals. You asked if I could answer. I, I can't answer it. I said I can't answer it. I can only talk about it, you know. I can say there are several possibilities for the fall festivals. One possibility is along the lines of what the dispensationalists have argued that they are associated with the end of time and the second coming of Christ. Even if they are, I wouldn't assign every detail to the same thing as they do. But, but there's certainly no reason I can see that, that I'd rule out the idea that the seven trumpets or the feast of trumpets uh, is actually one day uh, feast of trumpets uh, that could be the last trump that Paul talked about, you know, when Jesus comes back. I, I place no uh, weight on any of my theories about the festivals because, the fall festivals, because, again, the New Testament does not identify for us what the fulfillment of the fall festivals is. It does for Passover and Pentecost, but it does not for tabernacles and the, and the trumpets and things like that. So I stand with uh, admitted ignorance of you know, what the right interpretation of that would be, though I've certainly heard several. Sure. Not very helpful, I know. But uh, I don't know everything. Y yes, Katie? Um, okay, so um, we're supposed to be bringing forth God's justice and righteousness. Yes. Um, so what, what would you say that looks like? For those who couldn't hear it, um, she was saying that I mentioned earlier that we're supposed to bring forth justice and righteousness, which is the fruit that God's looking for from his people. What's that look like? Well, it looks a lot different than what I once thought. Uh, I once thought that justice and righteousness will come at the second coming of Jesus when he sets up the millennial kingdom. Until then, all we have to do is watch the sky and wait for Jesus to come. Um, however, uh, as I studied, especially the Old Testament prophets, and especially Isaiah, though it's, it comes up in other prophets too, Isaiah has a lot to say about God's plan and how the Messiah would bring it to pass. Um, in Isaiah 5, Isaiah has a parable of the vineyard that begins very similarly to the parable of the vineyard that Jesus taught. In fact, it begins just the same. A man had a, a planted a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. He put a wine press in it and hedge around it and so forth. And but Isaiah goes this direction. He says, and he looked that it would produce good grapes. But when he came looking for good grapes, he didn't find good grapes. He found wild grapes. That is sour, uncultivated kind of grapes, wild, which is not what he's looking for. And he says, you know, what more could I have done, God says, to my vineyard to get it to produce good grapes? I've done everything a person could do to expect good grapes. Why is it that when I did all of this, they produced wild grapes? And then he interprets it. This is Isaiah 5, 7. He says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his plant, the, the vine. He looked for, now this is where we find out what the fruit is, he's, the grapes he's looking for. He looked for justice, but he found oppression. And he looked for righteousness, but all he heard was a cry of the oppressed. And so the grapes he looked for were justice and righteousness. The grapes he got from Israel or oppression and injustice. Now what he's saying is he established Israel just like a man plants a vineyard because he had something he wanted from them. A man plants a vineyard because he wants grapes, good grapes. He planted Israel because he wanted a nation that bring forth justice, not oppression, righteousness, not wickedness. 
And th that's why he gave them his laws and he drove the Canaanites out so they wouldn't, or he actually promised to, they didn't, the Jews didn't do it. But the point is, God gave them a land, a fruitful land, potentially, uh, the law to guide them in the ways of righteousness and justice and so forth. He gave them everything and the prophets. Uh, and yet, instead of producing righteousness and justice, Israel was just as corrupt as the other nations. They were just as, uh, you know, the rich oppressed the poor, the judges took bribes uh, against the widows and the orphans and, and all this injustice. And God was looking for Israel to be a society, unlike the nations around it, that lived by God's standards and God's laws so that God would take delight in justice in their society. And no doubt that their society would then be a light to the other nations to kind of spread the ideas of God's justice and righteousness around so other nations could be more so. The Bible says that God is a just God and he loves justice. And But when you get to Isaiah 42, in the first four verses, it talks about the Messiah. And these verses are quoted about Jesus during his earthly ministry. Matthew quotes them in Matthew 12. As it talks about Jesus' ministry, it says... As it says in Isaiah, and it quotes this passage. So this passage in Isaiah is talking about Jesus at his first coming, not his second coming, not in the millennium. And in Isaiah 42, it says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, this is God speaking about Jesus, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail, nor be discouraged, until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands shall wait for his law. Now, in those four verses, it says the Messiah is going to come. He's going to establish justice among the Gentiles, justice in the earth. He will not fail. He will not be discouraged. This is, sounds like an impossible project, but he can do it. He won't even be discouraged. He's going to do it. Now, this is God's plan. Israel was supposed to bring forth justice in the earth, but they didn't. They brought forth as much wickedness as the pagans did, so he had to destroy them. But he raised up Jesus, and he is the servant who will successfully bring forth justice, the fruit God's looking for in the earth. Now, Isaiah has quite a few passages. I won't go into them now, but... If you've read Isaiah recently, you might remember reading several times, it talks about how the desert will blossom and bloom and produce fruit and, and the, uh, you know, the desert will become a fruitful field and things like that. That's a very common image in Isaiah. And it, it, mixed with that image are things where I'm going to open up rivers in the desert and the desert will blossom and produce fruit, fill the earth with its fruit. This idea of a river in the wilderness that transforms desert or wilderness into fruitful field. This image comes up more than half a dozen times in Isaiah. But one of the times, I think it's chapter 32, verse 15, this is one of those times that it's got that imagery. But in, uh, let's see if I'm right. Yep, I am. I hate being right so often. Uh, Isaiah 32, verse 14, it says, Because the palaces will be forsaken, the bustling city will be deserted, the forts and the towers will become lairs, like lairs for jackals and desert animals forever. A joy of wild donkeys, a pasture for flocks, until the spirit is poured out from on high. Now this corresponds to other places he talks about rivers in the desert. The spirit is being poured out. He's The Holy Spirit is the river that's poured out. And it says, and the wilderness becomes a fruitful field, and the fruitful field is counted a forest. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. That's the fruit he's looking for, justice and righteousness. He's saying, there's all this imagery in Isaiah of God pouring out a, a, a river in a desolate land, and it causes this desolate, fruitless land to produce the fruit that God wants. And then he, he says, that's the spirit. Till he pours out his spirit. And when he pours out his spirit, the wilderness will produce justice and righteousness. So it's, it's obvious that he's, this is spiritually talking. But then we have Jesus saying to Israel, because they didn't produce the grapes that the owner wanted and they killed the, the servants, they killed the son. Jesus said, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation that will bring forth the fruits of it. Now, the nation that will bring forth the fruits of it 
in the Old Testament, it's Jesus is the one who brings forth the fruits. The nation that brings forth the fruits are those who are in Christ, the body of Christ. The corporate body of Christ is that nation that will bring forth the fruit. Well, what's that look like, you say? Well, what would it have looked like with Israel if they'd done it right? They would have been a society that practiced justice instead of injustice. They would have been a haven for the, for there'd be no victims. You know, justice means that nobody's rights are violated. And if they are, the courts punish the perpetrator and, and defend and vindicate the rights of the innocent. The idea is justice is a, is a, is a phenomenon in which nobody oppresses anybody else. Nobody oversteps the rights of anyone else. There are no victims because only injustice causes victims. Uh, you can be a victim of injustice. You can't be a victim of justice. Uh, the idea is that God wants his people, Israel originally, now the people who are in Christ, to be a society that actually practices justice among themselves. And that's why Paul talks to the church, which is supposed to be such a society. You know, he, in, in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, how is it that some of you are taking each other to court? Why do you take each other to court? If someone wrongs you, why don't you just bear the wrong? Or if, if not, at least go to a wise Christian and let him arbitrate between you. Isn't there a wise man among you who can judge between his brothers and these things? The idea is the church is supposed to be an alternative society living by the standards of Christ and of God. And living so, a society governed by God is going to be practicing justice toward one another. Now, of course, the church isn't like that. In fact, the church today isn't even like a society at all. It's like a, it's like a theater. You know, there's performers up on stage and there's the audience in the seats. That's church today. The biblical church in the New Testament and what God intends for the church to be before he's done is a society, an alternative society in the world following King Jesus. And because they follow King Jesus, they treat each other according to his ways and injustice so that the world doesn't become a just place necessarily, although it might, but even if it doesn't, Christ's kingdom, Christ's people, those who are under the king, living in this world right now, treat each other according to the Sermon on the Mount, according to the teachings of Christ, and, and they treat each other justly, and there's, and there's no oppression. Remember in the book of Acts, it says about the early church when they got, were together, it says, there was none among them that lacked anything because those who had extra stuff would sell houses and lands and they'd distribute to the poor. So in the, in the Christian community, an alternative society, uh, separate from the world, separate from Jerusalem outside the church, there's this, there's this society of people following the ways of Christ and practicing among themselves justice and righteousness. And it says, and they had favor with all the people. Well, of course they would. We don't have favor with all the people. Most of the people who aren't Christians hate the church, or at least despise it. They think we're a bunch of hypocrites, a bunch of judgmental you know, people that just want to rain on their parade. You know, we just don't have any good reason for it, but we're just grumpy, and we, you know, we don't let ourselves do bad things, so we don't want them to either. You know, I mean, there's, the world doesn't know what to think of the church because the church doesn't look very much like the early church. What we have in the church now is a bunch of people who don't act very differently than non-Christians most of the time, and they come together on Sunday to sing songs as if they are better people than most. And as if God thinks of them as special people, even though they aren't any more devoted to him in their daily conduct and relationships than people outside the church are. You see, we have come to think of church as a meeting, as a religious service, as a worship service, where the early church, they got together every day. They met daily to sit under the apostles teaching and break bread. That's eating food. They had meals together. They prayed together. They fellowshiped together daily. They were a community of people living for Christ and for each other. And the world looked on from outside and said, wow, wish we had more of that. You know, maybe, maybe they've got something we need, you know. And, and that was a platform from which the, the apostles could preach this, the world outside about the kingdom of God. And the people hearing about the kingdom of God could be seeing it. In the people in the church. Oh, this is how, this is how people are when they have another king, one Jesus. This is the way it is when people are following Christ as the Lord. They actually do what He says, and they practice justice and righteousness among themselves. 
That's what it looked like in the early church. That's what it's supposed to look like. Now, I believe that if the church would start being that again, which I can't imagine that God would be satisfied for anything less, no doubt he's looking for more than that. <clears throat> it's been 2,000 years we should have produced a little more, not less than the early church did. But um, I, you know, I can't help but think that a church that really is a people, a community of followers of Christ who live like Christ said to live, that that would, I can't imagine that would not be attractive to an awful lot of people who would either become converted or even if they didn't become converted, which they need to, but even if they didn't, their consciences would be smitten that these people are doing things right. We don't do things right. Look, look you know, here's a countercultural community called Christians. And they, there's no divorce among them. They don't get drunk. There's no drug addiction among them. The kids aren't rebelling against their parents. There's no suicide. You know, there's, it's like they just follow the ways of God. That, and it's all good, you know? It's all good, and in contrast to our society outside, it's all, we're all bad. And there are people who love evil. But there's an awful lot more people, I think, who are hungry for good and never see it. David said in Psalm 4, there are many who say, who will show us any good? And then he says, Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. In other words, there's a lot of people out there hungry for good, but they don't see it anywhere. God, let us be the place they see it. Let your glory rise. Let your face rise upon us. Let, let the community of believers be the witness to what God is looking for in the world. Now, of course, there's no suggestion here that everyone's going to get saved. But even when people don't get saved, like in America or Europe for the past, whatever, 13 or 1,800 years, um, there never was a time when all the people in Europe got saved. But the, the morality, the spiritual light that came through the church and its influence there, elevated that society so they stopped sacrificing babies to demons you know uh, eventually you know marriage was considered to be monogamous slavery was eventually abolished um, women's rights you know, arose only in christian lands never in muslim lands or buddhist lands or hindu lands it's uh, in christian lands where, where christianity has been it has elevated the conscience and the awareness and the moral standards even of the world around them now that's not enough for them they're not going to go to heaven by raising their moral standards obviously but it's certainly better than a society where it was murdering each other like it was in the days of noah you know where the earth was filled with violence let's face it god has a plan for this earth he also has a plan for the church and the church is saved but we're not just saved to die and go to heaven. We're saved to be the people of God, the community of God, the kingdom of the king, the, the society of the Lord who do his ways and exhibit the alternative that God intends for people. Then when people see it, they can either be attracted to it and come to Christ. They can maybe not come to Christ, remain unsaved, but still, you know, start thinking, well, I think we ought to live better. I mean, it, we, I think when I was being raised, I thought it's not a good thing for people to live better if they're not saved. You know, I was actually told, you know, if you're not a believer, your good works, are, you know, God hates them. Well, the Bible doesn't say he hates our good works. We used to quote that verse in Isaiah, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But that was a total misquote of the verse. It's not talking about good people and their good works. God hates them. It's talk, all of our righteousnesses is what I say. It's talking about the religious actions, the sacrifices, all the, all the stuff they do at the temple. Because the, the people were wicked people, all their fake religiosity was a stink to God. That's what he's saying. But there are people who aren't wicked people. They just don't know God. They'd love to know God. if they. I mean, there are people who are they're sinners. They are going to hell. But, but they're not lovers of wickedness i mean this is something i think that calvinism tried to teach us is that everyone who's not born again is a hater of god because if you're not one of the elect you're one of the you know the reprobate and you hate god and no one seeks after god well that's simply not true there are people who are not christians 
like Cornelius, was not a Christian, but he was a good man. God even sent an angel to say, hey, God has heard your prayers. You know, you're, the things you're doing are pleasing to God. Go find Peter. He'll tell you how to get saved. But see, there, there are people who are not saved, but they still are not committed to evil. They're slaves of sin and need to be delivered, but they want, they, they value righteousness. That's why the early church had favor from all the people. The people outside the church, they weren't saved, but they, they could see a good thing. You know, Mother Teresa, everyone admires her. It doesn't take a Catholic or even a Christian to admire Mother Teresa. She was a good person. A bunch of unbelievers think, oh, that's a, boy, was she good. You know, of course she was good. And there are people who aren't Christians who recognize goodness when they see it. They just don't see it very often. And uh, that's what God wants. Like David said, many will say, who will show us any good? Oh, Lord, cause the light of your countenance to shine upon us. Uh, and may, may they see it in us, in other words. And that's what God has in mind, for the church to not just be a verbal witness. I, I, all my life, I've seen street preachers from the time I was young, and they're out there preaching the gospel as they understand it, out on the street corners. And yet people are holding their ears, they're cursing them, they're walking on the other side of the street. Eric used to live in San Francisco, or, or in, used to do outreach in San Francisco Street. And you've seen that, I'm sure, plenty of times, that you know, people out there just screaming and shouting at the sinners as they walk by, and the sinners are, you know, they're not attracted to that. But that's because they're, all they know of religion and Christianity is the hypocrites they've met and the, and the judgmentalism they've seen. And, and as far as they're concerned, this preacher is just another one of them. But the early church had preachers, but they also, their whole community preached the kingdom of God because they lived it as an alternative society in the world. And that's what God had in mind. That's what Jesus is gonna do. He's gonna establish justice among the Gentiles. And uh, it doesn't mean all the Gentiles are gonna get saved. But when you look at the history of the world, the parts of the world that have longest been influenced by Christianity are those parts of the world that saved or not are the most just. I mean, it's when missionaries went to China, that China had to stop binding the feet of baby girls and deforming their feet so that they were crippled when they grew up. They thought that was an attractive thing in girls, but the Christian missionaries protested it until the, the conscience of the Chinese, they just thought, well, I guess we won't do that anymore, you know? In India, the standard was for a, a, when a man died, his widow was burned on his funeral pyre. That was practiced up until modern times. Missionaries ended that. The, the influence of Christianity in a land that still is entirely Hindu, yet the influence of the kingdom of God like leaven and a lump of dough has elevated a, a, like a rising tide that raises all ships. It's like uh, the value of the truth and the light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When there's people walking and following him, they bring light. And light is, of course, some people hate the light. Jesus said, you know, the wicked hate the light because their deeds are evil. But not everyone's the wicked. Some people are drawn to the light. Some people want the light. Some people are tired of the darkness. They're afraid of the dark. We have to be light. Jesus said to the disciples, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill it cannot be hid. And so we are a city. We're a community, a society, an alternative in the world to what the world has seen. And when the church goes somewhere, things get better for that society, even for the unconverted. In my book, my recent book on Empire of the Risen Sun, I tell a story about a skeptical American soldier who was overseas and on an island he met a, a man who was from a tribe that had been cannibals before and he was carrying a Bible. And uh, the soldier said, oh, where I come from, we don't put much stock in that book anymore. And the native said, it's good for you that we do, or else you'll be dinner tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Christianity has ended cannibalism, headhunters, so forth. I, I was just telling this story this morning, uh, uh, and I, post, I posted it on Facebook, some of you may have seen it, that there was a missionary who went to Vanuatu, or was called New Hebrides at the time, the most primitive nation in the world, populated by tribal groups that were headhunters and cannibals. And 
many missionaries had gone there and been eaten. And so missionaries started going there, packing their clothes and stuff, not in luggage, but in coffins, because they expected to die. They got a one-way ticket to, to the mission field and, and took a coffin for them, their, their size, uh, which they didn't want to burden the, the, the locals to have to provide a coffin for them, so they brought their stuff with them in a coffin. And uh, finally, a missionary went there, and um, it was interesting because he, I think he came from England, I, and his name escapes me at the moment, but he was advised, if you go there, those cannibals, they'll just eat you. And he said, well, you know, in a few years, worms are going to eat you. So what's the difference? If cannibals eat your worms eat you, what's the difference? You know? And he went there, and he survived it, and he, and he converted the tribe, and he lived among them for 35 years. And when he died, they, the tribe's form, former cannibals buried him in the middle of their town and put up a memorial. They said, when he came, they said, before he came, there was no light. After he came, there was no dark. And that's a pretty powerful testimony of how the gospel and the kingdom of God brings light and changes societies. They were no longer cannibals. I have a friend who was with me until today, a South African man who's been to Vanuatu, and he's eaten, eaten bats with the natives there, but they don't eat people anymore. Um, so anyway, uh, what's it look like when justice is produced as fruit? People live just lives. They live righteous and just lives. That's what Jesus came to do. And I think we've too often been told that the, what Jesus came to do is to get us all to go to heaven, and we can't be good anyway. We're just a bunch of, you know, incorrigible sinners. So we just got to get saved by grace. And, and even though we don't ever get any better or do any better, we just go to heaven because of grace. Well, that's not the, that's not the message that Jesus preached and not even the message that Paul preached. Sure, Paul preached we're saved by grace. Who could deny that? We are. But Paul mostly wrote about how we're supposed to live. You read his epistles. It's mostly about how to live a holy life and how to treat each other and how to love each other and how to live as a, as a community of believers. That's what Paul's writings are mostly about. Uh, so, I mean, we've kind of only gotten hooked on the idea, I just need to make sure I get my ticket for heaven before I die. If I say a sinner's prayer, then I'll receive grace, my sins will be free, and I'll go to heaven. And, and we kind of make it seem like, now come quickly, Lord Jesus, because I don't know what else I'm going to do. I don't, I don't even know if I can hang on until you come, so come quickly. Well, we're not supposed to just be finding a way to hang on. We're supposed to be the aggressors here. We're the ones, we're the army of God. It's the devil that's afraid, not us. The devil has his kingdom and those who follow him. God has his kingdom and those who follow him. And the Bible says, resist the devil, he'll run away from you. The demons are, they believe and tremble. They, they're, they're the ones afraid of us, but they've got nothing to be afraid of as long as we're cowering saying, oh, I hope the devil doesn't take away my salvation before Jesus comes back. Come on, grow up, be a Christian. Be a follower of Christ, be a disciple, be a martyr if necessary. Because martyrs, you know, the blood of martyrs is seed of the church. The kingdom of God has very often expanded because of martyrs who died. Uh, you know, everyone knows the story of Jim Elliot, I suppose. Very famous. He and his four companions went down to uh, Ecuador to reach the uh, Orani natives. And, and he was, uh, they were all killed. And I always like to see it this way. The devil saw them coming, and he was terrified that these five guys could take this tribal group away from the devil, so he had them kill the missionaries. But he overreached, because when news got back to America about the death of these missionaries, it is said that over a 1,000 American college students signed up to go on the mission field. And, of course, the wives of the slain missionaries went down and converted the tribe anyway. So here's the devil. He thinks he's going to protect his territory by killing these five missionaries. Instead, they die. A thousand new missionaries come. The devil probably didn't see that coming. And the tribe he was trying to protect got converted by their wives anyway. So, I mean, the kingdom of God is powerful. It's mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So that's what, that's what our warfare is, that's what our mission is. 
And God, we, we think, oh, you know, it must be near the end. We don't have, time, don't have time to change anything in the world. We have no idea if we're very near the end. Dispensationalists say we are because they, well, Israel, you know, that's the last generation. That's what they were saying back in the 70s. Dispensationalism taught, and I have to say that my pastor, Chuck Smith, taught it too, although I love the man, I disagree with this point. Hal Lindsey said the same thing in his book, Late Great Planet Earth. He said, Israel became a nation in 1948. Jesus said, he didn't, but they said that he said that the, nation, the generation that sees Israel become a nation will also see the second coming. Jesus never said anything remotely like that, but it's a misinterpretation of something Jesus said in Matthew 24. Anyway, the idea is a generation is 40 years. Israel became a nation in 1948. That generation cannot pass before Jesus comes. That'd be 1988. Most of you guys probably weren't even born in 1988, I imagine. You know, probably. But 88 was supposed to be the end of the world as far as Hal Lindsey and Chuck Smith were concerned. Chuck said it in his, wrote it in his books and said it in the pulpit. So did Hal Lindsey. And so did a lot of people. But... Because the end had to be in 1988, the rapture had to come on their system seven years earlier, so the rapture had to come no later than 1981. Now, that's what I was hearing in 1970. And so we all thought, wow, Jesus is coming back, you know, before I'm even old. Uh, well, 1981 came and went. 1988 came and went. 1989 came and went. The year 2000 came and went. The year 2020 came and went. And who knows how many more decades or centuries may came and went before, before Jesus comes. It is certainly not the case that the generation that saw Israel become a nation is necessarily going to be alive when, when Jesus returns. Most of that generation is dead already. Well, well I mean, let's see. That was 80-something 80, 80 years ago, something like that, or... No, it's 70, 73 years ago. 73 years ago. Okay, some of us are still alive. I wasn't alive in 1948. But most of the people who were are dead now. And, but the thing is, Jesus didn't say that the generation that sees Israel become a nation will see Jesus come back. They misquote him completely. What Jesus said is he gave a whole bunch of signs and he said, now consider the fig tree. When it puts forth its leaves and its shoots are tender, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things begin to take place, know that it is near even at the doors. This generation will not pass before all these things come to pass. Now, I'm not going to talk to you about what all these things is referring to, but he didn't say anything about a, a generation that sees the fig tree. He made a statement, when you see fig trees blossom and bloom, you know winter's over. And, and summer is near. In fact, in Luke, in the parallel in Luke, he says, consider the fig tree and all the trees when they blossom, but you know summer is near. It's, he's not saying that this represents Israel becoming a nation, but the dispensation is, oh, the fig tree blossoming represents the end times Israel becoming a nation. Jesus never said it meant that. Nothing in the Old Testament said it means that. There's nothing in the Bible that says it means that. He was making an illustration from nature. You can tell when summer is near by looking at the trees. You can tell when what I'm predicting is near by looking and seeing these signs. He's not, and, and when he said this generation will not pass, he's not his own generation. Jesus used the expression this generation about five times in the Gospel of Matthew, always speaking about his own generation. He didn't say that generation will not pass. He said this generation will not pass. And so... Anyway, dispensationalism has been wrong again and again, but, uh, and, and they predicted many times the second coming of Christ. Uh, but Jesus didn't give us any information for predicting the time of his coming. In fact, he said to his disciples, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has put in his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. So it's not for you to know, or even if it's not for me to know the times and the seasons, why should I spend any time trying to know it? If God wanted me to know it, I mean, if it was important for me to know it, then it would be something God wants me to know, I suppose. Jesus says, God doesn't want you to know that. It's not for you. That's not your problem. Don't think about it. You just go and occupy until I come. 
th this whole focus on is the end time near? Is Jesus coming soon? That's just totally rejecting what Jesus said. Jesus said, it's not for you to know those kinds of things. Do what I said to do, and don't worry about the times and the seasons that the Father has put in his own authority. He can take care of that. And if you say, but I want to know, well, you're rebelling against Jesus. He said, it's not for you to know. I don't want you to know. God doesn't want you to know. Jesus said, at a time when you do not think, your Lord will come. In Matthew 24. He said that he's going to come when you're not expecting him. So why, why be expecting him? Just go about your business. Serve the Lord and let God come when you're not expecting him. That's what Jesus said. And it's so wrong-headed. Many, many ministries focus almost entirely on end times prophecies. And they've one thing they've been is wrong every single time they've predicted anything. You know, there's a, a ministry on the radio. I won't give you its name, but it's been on since I was a kid. These old guys with Oklahoma accents. Not, not J. Vernon McGee, but uh, <laughs> some less, not, not as well known as J. Vernon McGee, but there's some couple old guys uh, that are on there. And they're always talking about the end times. End times, end times. They've been doing it since I was a kid. That's been, of course, 60 years now. And... Uh, and it's so funny because I remember every time I'd listen to them when I'd be driving, they'd be saying, everything in the world right now is lined up exactly the way the Bible said it would be when Jesus comes back. The rapture could happen at any time because it's all lined up. Russia and the you know, common market in Europe and China with their 100 million men and 200 million men and so forth. And they say everything's lined up geopolitically in a way that the Bible said would be in the end times. And then in the 80s, remember the you guys weren't alive, but in the 80s, the Berlin Wall went down, and communism essentially fell. And geopolitics, like there's a revolution in geopolitics, communism, which had controlled over a quarter of the world's population, suddenly wasn't controlling people anymore. It's like a totally different geopolitical situation. And I, I was eager to hear what these guys had to say about that. I already didn't believe what they said anyway, but I, I just I wonder what they'll say now. Because before the Iron Curtain fell, everything geopolitically was exactly the way the Bible said it would be. Now things have just totally reversed. And you know what they said the next day? Everything in the world is exactly the way the Bible said it would be. <laughs> they, of course, they couldn't have predicted that from the Bible. But anything that happens, they can say, oh, that's exactly what the Bible says it's going to be. And they've been saying that for actually a few hundred years. And, uh, uh, you know, someone's going to be right someday, but it'd be better just not to gamble on it. Why not just do what Jesus said? Occupy. Do the will of God. Promote the kingdom. Promote justice. Promote righteousness. Promote Christ. Yes, Paul? How does, uh, how does what you just said about uh, don't worry about when Christ comes back fit with uh, Christ saying, be watchful, be ready? It's actually in the same passage in Matthew 24 where he says, be watchful, that he says, the, your Lord's going to come when you don't think he's coming. He says, if, a, if the owner of the home, if the, if the good man of the house knew at what hour the thief would come, he would have stayed awake and would not allow his house to be broken into. He says, so also you watch because you don't know when your master's coming. Well, in other words, watching doesn't mean somehow by watching you're going to know. It's in that very passage. You need to be watchful because you won't know. You know, you need to be, as it were, spiritually awake all the time. And doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, I mean, when he says, in the same passage, he says, who is that good and faithful servant whom his master has put in charge over all of his goods to give to his fellow servants uh, food in due season? He says, blessed is, is that man if when his master comes, he finds him doing that. He says, I say he will you know, give him all his goods. But he says, but if that wicked servant says in his heart, my Lord delays his coming and begins to eat and drink with the drunkard and beat his fellow servants, that wicked servant, when this, his, the Lord will come at a time, he doesn't think and, and, and will cut him in two and give him his part with the uh, hypocrites, he says. That's at the end of Matthew 24. Now, he's saying he's given his servant something to do. They better be found doing that when he comes back. And they'll be blessed if they are. Uh, they don't know when he's going to come. 
neither the good servants nor the bad servants know when he's going to show up. He said, if you're one of the bad servants, you're going to really be in trouble when he shows up when you're not looking for him because you'll be totally unprepared. But if you're obedient, you'll be prepared. Not because you knew he was going to come that day or even that year or even in your lifetime, but because it doesn't matter. You're ready. You're ready all the time. Uh, you know, I, I, I remember hearing on the radio one of these preachers saying, the Bible says we need to be watching for the signs of the times. No, it doesn't. The Bible nowhere says that we should be watching for the signs of the times. In fact, the term signs of the times is found in only one passage in the Bible, and it's not about the end times. Jesus said, you Pharisees, you can tell by the color of the sky whether it's going to be good weather tomorrow or not. How can you discern the signs of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times? Meaning, why can't you tell what times you're living in? Don't you see the Messiah is here? You know, how can you predict the weather from the signs of the sky, but you can't even tell what times you're living in? Now, the only reference in the entire Bible to the phrase signs of the times is in that passage. And he doesn't say to his disciples, be looking for the signs of the times, because he didn't give them any signs of the times. He says it's going to be like the days of Noah. People were eating and drinking and buying and selling and getting married, doing normal stuff that people always do, and did not know until the day that Noah entered the ark that, and the flood came and took them all away. In other words, it's going to be kind of normal life right up until the moment that no one's expecting it to happen. And then it comes. He says, so shall it be in the time, in the day of the son, coming of the Son of Man. So anyway, I, I realize, I warned you I might scare you off, but uh, I was a Calvary Chapel teacher. I was an elder at Calvary Chapel Santa Cruz for several years after I moved north. And I was the main teacher in the church for three years. And, uh, and I, I know Calvary Chapel. I know the teaching of Calvary Chapel. I repeated the teaching of Calvary Chapel. And I love Calvary Chapel. I love Chuck Smith. He's my mentor. But you can love someone and still disagree with some things they said. And one of the things I, that I disagree with is the idea that we need to be always focused on the end times. Well, what are we getting done? Well, you know, some of us become Calvary Chapel pastors, and so we preach and teach other people to watch for the end times. Well, but what's everyone supposed to be doing is a question, not the few who become pastors and, and evangelists. What's the body of Christ supposed to do until Jesus comes? All that. We're supposed to be an alternative society. We're supposed to function as the kingdom of the king, the followers of the king, uh, the servants of the Lord. Those who, as a society collectively, exhibit the glory of God like a city on a hill that cannot be hid, being the light of the world. That's, that's lifestyle stuff. That's relational stuff. Because when Christians are getting divorced at the same rate as non-Christians, well, that's a failure in relationships. And that failure in relationships is advertising to the world, we don't know the answer any more than you do. Our marriages fall apart just as much as yours do. Now, that's not the answer. The answer we have for the world is not, we don't know any better than you guys. You know, let us know if you figure it out, because we need to know too. No, our message is, we know the ways of God, because God has visited us in Christ. He has instructed us in the ways of his kingdom. He has taught us how to relate, to love one another, and how to, you know, endure hardship and to stay together when we made vows to stay together, and to be faithful people and just people and righteous people and but but you know when <clears throat> when christians cheat at their business because they want to get rich just like other people do when they divorce their wives because they found someone they like better when they have you know when the, when the christian community doesn't have any standards consistently practiced among them that are any higher than the standards of the world it's just a way of saying to the world don't bother listening to us we haven't got it figured out either the early church when people looked at them the lifestyle of the early church was declaring, hey, these people have it figured out. These people know their God because their God has taught them what no one else knows, and that's how to love one another, how to be righteous people. No other society knows how to do that except these people who follow this King Jesus. And that's, that is a testimony to the world, but we don't have it. We don't have it because the church in America 
has decided it's more important just for me to get to heaven. And, uh, you know, I'll tell as many people as I can to get them to go to heaven too. But as far as this world is concerned, what do I care about it? Well, God cares about it. Jesus said, pray this prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done where? On earth as it is in heaven. That's what God's purpose is. That's what we're praying for. That's the first petition on the list that Jesus told us to pray daily. Pray that his will be done on earth. It's not just that we can escape from here. It's that his will will be done through Christ and the nations will, will learn justice through him. He will establish justice among the Gentiles and he will not fail or be discouraged before he's done that. That's what the Bible teaches. And we, we look at the parts of the Bible that tell us, you know, how we're going to get out of this world. Uh, but, but Jesus didn't let us out of this world. Jesus prayed, Father, I pray you will not take them out of the world, but that you'll keep them from the wicked one. And we think that the best thing that Jesus can do is take us out of the world. He prayed, no, don't take them out of the world. That's, that's uh, by the way, John 17 and 15. Uh, don't take them out of the world. Keep them from the wicked one because they got a mission in the world. This, you know, the Bible says of Jesus in Psalm 2.8, it's a messianic psalm. God speaks to Jesus and he says, ask of me and I'll give you the heathen, the nations for your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for your possession. Jesus said to his disciples on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. There's gonna be a new earth. Not this fallen earth. There's going to be an earth where there's no more curse. But it's going to be an earth that, it's going to be a renewed earth that God's going to do. Paul said that the whole creation is groaning and travailing, waiting for this time when the, there's the manifestation of the children of God in the redemption of our bodies. But he said that the creation itself is going to be delivered from the bondage of corruption uh, into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. That's in Romans 8. So we got, God has a purpose for us in the world and most of us are just saying how quick can i get out of here not like i want to die i just want to be raptured you know well don't worry you will die and you will get out of this world or you'll be raptured but the point is before that what are you supposed to be doing and that's what the most of the new testament is about and the old testament too because the prophecies about the messiah and his kingdom are in isaiah and other places like that very clear and Jesus came to fulfill those prophecies, as he said. He said, I don't, don't think I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I didn't come to destroy them. I came to fulfill them. So, I mean, it's not like the Old Testament prophets have nothing to say about our mission or Christ's mission. They have a lot to say about his mission. He said, in the volume of the book, it's written of me. And, and he came to fulfill those things. And we are his body. He's the head. We're the body and we're the, we're the uh, operation of Christ. Christ as a kingdom of, of uh, priests and of uh, followers of the Messiah. And so, I mean, this is something that obviously it's a different outlook than, uh, than say, the dispensational view that's mostly about get as many people saved as possible because we're getting out of here. You know, the Bible says in Psalm 115 and verse 16, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he's given to the sons of men. God didn't make us for heaven. He made us for the new earth. In fact, if Adam and Eve had never sinned, they'd still be alive on the earth now. It'd be unfallen. They'd be immortal. They'd be eating the tree of life and living forever. But they, they'd be on earth because that's where God made people to be. The earth he has given to the sons of men. Uh, it's just that the men botched it. Sons of men misstewarded, mismanaged it. And Jesus came back to reclaim what was lost as the second Adam and to make a society of people who will do what Adam and Eve failed to do and what Israel failed to do and which Jesus will not fail to do. So, I don't know how we got off on all that. Oh, we are talking about justice. Yeah, what's it look like? Yeah, so at, at the very least, the community of Christ should be a community of justice. We should act justly toward each other. Never cheat, never lie, never violate anybody in any way. And if everyone did that, you'd have a, a society with no victims. You know, in our present secular society, there's this big promotion of you're a victim. 
if you're anything other than a white straight male, you're, you're disempowered, you're oppressed, you're a victim. Yeah, well, that's not exactly true, but there are victims in the world. There are people who victimize other people. It's not quite divided along racial lines like that. <laughs> There's black people and, and red people and yellow people and white people that oppress white people and red people and black and brown people. I mean, there's, it's not divided like that, but it is true. There is oppression, there is injustice. And yet in the society, in the community of the saints of Christ, there should be none. People should be able to look at the, at the church as a community of people on the earth and say, you know, what's conspicuous by its absence is injustice in their society. There's no, no injustice, there's no oppression, there's no one taking advantage of other people, there's no one stealing, there's no one, you know, breaking their vows. They're obeying, they're, they're like, they're Christians of all things. And yet we think being a Christian just means getting your ticket to heaven. No, being a Christian means being like Jesus and obeying Christ, being a follower of Jesus, obeying him. And that's, that's what a disciple is. Jesus said, if you continue in my words, you're my disciples indeed, in John 8, 31. And when he said to go make disciples of all nations, he says, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. That's how you make disciples of all nations. You baptize them as you convert them. They come to Christ. They come to, con to salvation. Then you make a disciple. How? Teach them to observe everything Jesus commanded. In other words, you train them to be followers of Christ, to be obedient to Christ. That's what he said. That's the commission. Matthew, you can read it yourself, Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. That's the Great Commission. We not only get people converted, we have to train them and convert them and, and, and um, teach them to observe everything Jesus said. Why? Because a society that observes everything Jesus said is a society, a vineyard producing the kind of good grapes that God's been looking for from the beginning and which he hasn't gotten much of. That's why I'm not so sure Jesus is coming back that soon. Maybe he will. It's okay with me. I hope he does. But I think God's been looking for this fruit for a long time, and he's still looking for it. But Jesus said the kingdom is given to a people who will bring forth the fruit of it. So if it hasn't happened yet, it must be, still be in the future. All right, well, we've run over time. Got two questions in. <laughs> we have an hour, uh, two hours and uh, ten minutes, and we got two questions coming. Excellent. Well, we don't always take quite so long, but the questions were a little sparse tonight. Um, anyway, we do this from time to time. Uh, so, let's. Uh, why don't we just close in prayer? And um, Paul, I'd love for you to close in prayer for us. Sure, Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Uh, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you are a good and loving Heavenly Father, and, and we are your children. And you love to give your children good gifts. One of those good gifts was the Bible, where we find out about you and who you are and your character. You've given us the gift of good teachers like Steve Craig and many good Bible teachers. You've given most of us help and uh, anyone who lives in America because just the gift of, of uh, growing up in a, in a good place. Mm -hmm. We thank you that you're a good God. We thank you for what we learned tonight. Help us to meditate on the way home and, and uh, to retain what you want us to retain. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you.